Gospel ministry attracts opposition. It should ring a bell. You heard me say those words a few weeks ago, like, like a, a summer picnic attracts flies. So also, gospel ministry attracts opposition, and it attracted opposition in the life of an early Christian named Stephen. It continues to attract opposition today. And you recall, Stephen was a, was a man in the early church who, who debated with with unbelieving Jews who brought slanderous accusations against him and, and dragged him before the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, and he spoke to them. He spoke to them about the, the lack of fidelity on the part of their fathers throughout the generations as they opposed the activity and the Spirit of God, and he said that that activity of opposition to the Spirit of God has culminated in you, for you have crucified the very Son of God. And of course, the Jewish leaders were enraged and they erupted in, in violent rage and they dragged Stephen outside of the city and f- in essence forming a lynch mob, summarily executed him outside of the city. And a, and a young man, a young Pharisee by the name of Saul, who would later become the Apostle Paul, saw what they were doing and approved of Stephen's execution. But, but I want to ask the question, what happened after Stephen died? what happened after that violence erupted. I mean, Stephen had, had died with the faith of a martyr. Like, like his Savior before him, Stephen had died praying for the souls of the very people who were in the business of murdering him. But then what? What happened after Stephen died? Well, in, in answering that question, I invite you to open with me in your Bible to Acts chapter 8. We'll be looking at the first three verses. If you don't have a Bible with you, grab one of those black Bibles in the pew in front of you, and you'll find Acts chapter 8 on page 916 in that Bible. And as we read these words, I want you to be asking yourself, well, what did, what did happen after Stephen died? And listen for how, for how Luke explains that a persecution erupted against the church. After Stephen died, a persecution erupted against the church, but also that the church continued to witness to Jesus Christ in spite of that persecution. And it's with that in mind that I'll read from Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, and as we read together, remember that this is God's holy word. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison." The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Stephen's execution uh, was not planned. Stephen's execution was not the result of a deliberative judicial body making a dispassionate decision based upon the law. It was impulsive. It was carried out in anger. They were enraged. I want you to remember that Luke said that these men to whom Stephen spoke bared their teeth at him like like animals, and they rushed at him and dragged him outside of the city. And so it's not surprising that given that type of emotional eruption, that it spilled over and continued even after Stephen was dead. And so if we ask the question, what happened after After Stephen's death, we see firstly that a persecution erupted. A persecution erupted against the church. And I want to look briefly at the the nature of that persecution and then also at the extent of it. And if we look at the nature of it, we see very, very firstly that it was, well, it it was brutal. Verse 3 says that Saul was ravaging the church. That's a a word that is used to describe what a wild animal... uh, Uh, what a wild animal would do to the corpse of another animal that it has just killed. It's a word that, that pictures ripping and tearing of flesh. And Luke uses this word, it's a violent word, and he says that Saul had been ravaging, was ravaging, and would continue ravaging the church. It was, it was brutal, and Paul admits 
later on, as, as Paul becomes a believer and becomes a missionary in the early church, there are a couple of occasions where he admits what was motivating him and just the extent to which he was brutal with Christians. And so in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul writes, You have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And then later on, as, as Paul is imprisoned in, imprisoned in Caesarea Philippi, and he speaks to, to Agrippa about his own history, he says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. It's a brutal persecution that erupted against the church as Saul is ravaging the church from, from house to house. That's the same ra- phrase that Luke uses earlier in Acts chapter 5 and verse 42 when he says of the early church every day in the temple and from house to house. They did not stop teaching and preaching that Jesus is the Christ. Same phrase from from house to house. And remember, Jerusalem is a walled city at this time. It's not a big city. It's maybe three quarters of a mile long and a half, half mile wide. And the estimates of how many people lived in Jerusalem vary widely. Some people say as low as 30,000 people within the walls of the city. Some people say upwards of 100,000 people. Many more thousands of people in the countryside around. But it was, a, it was a small city. And remember that the stoning of Stephen took place somewhere between maybe 12 months to, to three years after after the resurrection of Jesus. And during that time, however long it was, the, the, the apostles and the disciples had saturated the city of Jerusalem with teaching about, about Jesus. Remember the indictment that the Sanhedrin leveled at, at Peter and John. You have filled Jerusalem with this teaching. And people estimate that maybe one in five, maybe one in four residents of Jerusalem at this time was was a Christian because the city had been saturated with the gospel. It was a small city. It was a divisive subject. There had been a lot of public teaching and preaching. And the point in verse 3 is that Paul, or Saul, was ravaging the church, entering house after house. In other words, the implication is this. They knew where the Christians lived. This isn't a random house-to-house, street-by-street, knocking on a door. Are there any Christians here? They already knew where the Christians lived. Anybody grow up in a small town? You got to know people, didn't you? It was personal. It wasn't just brutal. It was personal. As they went from house to house where the Christians lived and dragged them away to prison. And so the nature of the the persecution was, it was brutal and it was personal, but there's an extent to the person that, persecution as well. There's a geographic extent. extent. There arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And, And by all accounts, at least at this point in time, it appears to be confined to Jerusalem. Because after the believers are scattered into Judea and Samaria, they have fruitful ministries in Judea and Samaria. And you will know that Jesus told his disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost ends of the earth. And the Lord used this persecution to scatter his church out of Jerusalem where they had been teaching and preaching and to get them out into Judea and into Samaria. And that doesn't mean that being persecuted felt good or that they enjoyed it, but it does mean that the Lord used it for the spread of the church and the salvation of many, and in the meantime, it appeared to have been confined, the extent of the persecution, to Jerusalem. And so the geographic persecution was, was limited, but there was a demographic extent as, as well, as, it was, as that also was likewise limited. There arose on that day, verse 1, a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. We might ask why that might be the case. Well, you remember that there are two types of Jews in the early church. There's the Hebraic Jews who have maintained speaking and synagogue worship in Aramaic 
which is a derivative of Hebrew, and they're dressed like traditional Jews. And then there are Greek-speaking Jews who've returned to the Promised Land from various places in the Roman Empire. They have Greek names, they dress like Greeks, and their synagogue worship is conducted in Greek. And those groups had reconciled within the church because the dividing wall of hostility had been torn down. They were brothers and sisters. But in the, the eyes of the Pharisees and in the eyes of the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, that Greek-speaking contingent had abandoned much of what was distinctively Jewish, and they were, in a sense, traitors and compromisers. And it's interesting to note that the Greek ones were scattered. Acts 8 testifies that Philip, who was one of those Grecian Jews, uh, ministered profitably in Samaria. Acts chapter 9 says that Barnabas, who was one of those Hebraic Jews, had the freedom to go in and out of, of Jerusalem. So some were scattered, and some remained. Why? Well, to continue to show Christ Jesus to the Jews in Jerusalem, to love the persecutors. Remember what the faith of the martyr is. The faith of the martyr is the one who's praying for the person who's persecuting you. The faith of a martyr is praying for one who is in the business of killing you as they're in the business of killing you because you value their soul in the sight of God and want to seek their salvation even though they're they're hurting you, and so some remained in Jerusalem to continue to testify and witness to the persecutors. So if we ask the question, well, what happened after Stephen died? A persecution erupted. A persecution against the church erupted. Now, it uh, just so happens that this particular date, May 18th, 1980, will mean something to some of you. It means something to me because I was born and raised in Washington State. And May 18th, 1980 is the day when Mount St. Helens erupted. And there were rumblings ahead of time. Uh, geologists had been monitoring the mountain because there was a series of, a, of small earthquakes and a couple of puffs of smoke coming from the top of the mountain. And there was, a, there was a bulge on the side of the mountain and they were measuring the extent to which the mountain was deforming its shape. But nobody anticipated the violence of the eruption that was going to follow. And it took everybody by surprise. It was almost as though it was, it was smoldering, but then the extent of the eruption was a shock. And here you can see in the early church that there's a disagreement, obviously, between unbelieving Jews and be, between believing Jews who had become Christians. And Jerusalem had been saturated with this teaching. And there's underlying tension that now, after Stephen, erupts in a type of violence that, that maybe they couldn't have anticipated. But if you expect something, you can begin to prepare for it. No matter how remote it might be, if you expect it, then it makes sense to begin to prepare for it. So for instance, how many people here have a functioning smoke alarm in their house? Oh, raise your hand. You know you do. What is the likelihood really in your lifetime that you're going to suffer a devastating house fire? It's probably pretty slim, but it might happen. And because it might happen, you have a smoke alarm in your house. Well, the likelihood that we here in this nation are going to suffer this type of devastating eruption of persecution in our lifetime, still probably pretty slim, but, but to prepare for it, to expect it, is to prepare for it. If the scripture testifies to anything, it can be swift. It can go from a, from a smoldering, uh, smoldering thing to an inferno in a moment. It's uneven. Some people are affected more than others. Some demographic groups are affected more than others. Some areas are hit harder than others. But it's also an opportunity to display the faith of martyrs, to testify to Christ Jesus in the face of and pray for those who are persecuting you. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Now, we don't face this kind of intensity of persecution, but even as, as Dr. Perry has said, there are places in the world where this is happening. There are places in the world where people are being killed for their faith in Christ or where their businesses are being seized for their faith in Christ, where the government officials, officials are going into schools and churches and burning books and confiscating them. There, there are places where it's physically dangerous to be a Christian in this world. This is still happening. Now, it may not be happening here, but there's no guarantee that it won't. And, and sometimes that type of persecution falls on the church. Because if we're going to be faithful in gospel ministry, gospel ministry attracts opposition. It always has, 
and it always will. Gospel ministry attracts opposition, and it may not be as violent as this, but it will be there, and we should expect it, because to expect it is to prepare for it. And so if we ask the question, well, what happened after Stephen died? It's very clear that a persecution erupted against the church, but that's not all that happened because the church then had to respond to it. And so what happened after Stephen died is that the church witnessed. Persecution erupted, but the church continued its work of witnessing uh, to Jesus. And and again, I want to look at the nature and the extent of, of that witness. And if we look at the nature of the witness, we find that it was defiant. It was a defiant witness in a good way. Look at Look at verse 2. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. Uh, this is really the practical outworking of what, uh, what the Scripture says in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. Peter and the apostles answered to the Jewish leaders and said, We must obey God rather than men. So in verse 2, devout men, that is believers who are in view here, on the same day that the persecution erupted, these men publicly associated themselves with Stephen, and by implication, they publicly associated themselves with Stephen's Lord, that is, with Jesus. And the oral laws of the Pharisees had some things to say about that. The oral laws of the Pharisees said that you, you must bury a man. They had enough respect for human life that the person, even a criminal, had to be buried and dealt with appropriately. But they also forbade any sign of public sympathy for an executed criminal. Pharisaical law forbade any sign of public sympathy for an executed criminal, and therefore weeping and lamentation over the body of a dead criminal was prohibited. But these devout men were publicly defying Pharisaical law, publicly defying the very men who had just thrown the rocks to kill their brother, and they're weeping and lamenting over him in defiance of those men. Literally, the text says that they made a great beating over him, and the images of them beating their chest and wailing in public, and so they, they witnessed defiantly to the very men who had just murdered Stephen. But it's also a docile witness. There's something about them that has been tempered in Christ. Because if you look at at verse 3, Saul is going house after house, and he drags off men and women and committed them to prison, and there's no indication from the text that they were returning violence for violence. There's no indication that because they were being ravaged, they ravaged in return. And that makes sense, because Jesus taught in Matthew 5, 39, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek... Turn to him, the other also. And Jesus had set an example, which Peter notes in 1 Peter 2, 23. When Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And so there's no indication that these Christians sought to do harm to their persecutors. Who behaves like that? Who? Who does that? People whose hope and home lay beyond the reach of persecutors behave like that. People whose home and hope are simply beyond the reach of persecution. And so the church witnessed, it was a defiant witness, and it was a a docile witness, as they didn't return evil for evil. But if we look at the extent of of the church's witness, again, look at verse 3, he he dragged them off where? He dragged them off to, to prison. And to be willing to go there if necessary to testify to Jesus. To be willing to die if necessary that Jesus might be glorified and and that the very person who's dragging you off to prison might then know the love and grace of God. Who who does that? Who goes to that extent? (laughs) They went all the way to prison for him who went all the way to the cross for them. And it's only that understanding, it's only that truth that can lead a person to be willing to do that, to go to that extent, to be a witness for the Lord and to the lost. And so if we ask the question, well, what what happened after Stephen died? Surely it's very clear that a persecution erupted against the church, but that the church continued to witness to Jesus in the face of the persecution. Now, when I was in the, in the Navy, I did a lot of reading up on uh, Navy and Marine Corps history and various battles and whatnot so that I could talk shop with Marines because 
they were far more interested in talking about shooting things than they were in talking about theology. But every once in a while, I got to talk to them about theology by means of talking about shooting things. One of the, one of the battles that has always uh, impacted me was uh, a battle in, in, the, in the invasion of Okinawa over a place called Sugarloaf Hill. And Sugarloaf Hill was a small hill that looked like a bread loaf, and that's why the Marines named it what they did, but it was an anchor point for something called the Shuri Line. The Shuri Line was a defensive line that ran across uh, Okinawa, and, and it was bristling. Uh, Sugarloaf Hill was like a honeycomb. It had been, it had been tunneled out, and there were uh, machine gun placements, uh, mortar placements, uh, there were rails inside the mountain to move artillery around from inside the mountain. There were ammunition stores and food and provision for weeks and weeks on end. And when the Marines first uh, came up to, to Sugarloaf Hill, what they ended up running into was just a buzzsaw. They ran into a hail of gunfire and artillery. There was no point of access to the hill that was not covered by overlapping fields of fire and by pre-positioned mortar emplacements. It was, it was a hornet's nest, and they ran into it, suffered horrible losses. And so then what did they do? Over the course of the next four days, no less than 13 times they assaulted the hill until they had taken it, and then two weeks later they secured the island. Now, we fight with different weapons. We attack with the gospel. We attack with obedience to Christ and love for the lost. But, but there's a testimony here in the scripture that we keep fighting. What happens when persecution erupts? You tell them about Jesus. What happens when they tell you to stop telling them about Jesus? You tell them about Jesus. It's, you just keep going and, and keep witnessing. And we don't face at least... right. Right now, the type of persecution that the early church faced, but their model should guide our thinking. If, if you are slandered for sharing your faith in Christ Jesus, what should you do? Carry on in gospel ministry and share your faith again. If the world jeers because, because the church won't accept the, the sexual ethic that the world presents to us, what, what should the church do? Witness Again, carry on in gospel ministry. If you share your faith with your neighbor and the person with whom you have shared it rejects you, what should you do? You should carry on in gospel ministry and witness again because, because the story of the storm of persecution that, that erupted around the men who, who buried Stephen, I, I don't know about you, but I think that might have silenced me. I mean, if I just saw a, a man murdered before my eyes for associating himself with Jesus, I'm not 100% sure that I would have the courage then immediately to associate myself with Jesus. But this is what we're called to do, to carry on gospel ministry. How do you do that? How do you cultivate that type of courage? How do you cultivate that peace? How do you cultivate that calm? How do you live in that type of defiance? It's only through faith in Christ. Ask, ask the Lord to produce in you boldness. Ask for a hope and a home that are beyond the reach of persecutors. Ask. I mean, you think of, you think of Peter. We often think of Peter as being bold and courageous. Peter as being the one who defies the Sanhedrin. And Peter as being the one who, who preaches Christ. And then you look, at, you look at Peter when Jesus was persecuted. And the difference is the presence of the Holy Spirit in Peter. And it's supernatural. The ability to be this type of witness is supernatural. So ask, and ask for the right reason. Don't ask for yourself. Don't ask so that you can be seen as a super Christian, but ask for the glory of Jesus Christ in the salvation of the lost. How, how do you cultivate a faith strong enough to be willing to go to prison for him who went to the cross for you? Well, well be in the word and sacraments and prayer ultimately dipping your toes into the water of gospel ministry. And here's why it matters. Nobody wakes up one morning overnight bold and ready to go be an apostle. You just, you just don't wake up like that, bold and ready to be persecuted. Lord, bring it on. You know, that's just not how we are. What happens then is you engage in gospel ministry in small ways and you take it on the chin a little bit. Somebody says something, you get rejected, you get scorned, somebody mocks you, somebody writes something nasty on social media about you. And then you learn, then you learn it's okay. 
Then you learn, blessed are you when people persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you on account of me, for great is your reward in heaven. It's the same way that they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then you step out in faith a little bit more in gospel ministry and you take it on the chin just a little bit harder and you learn. It's not just okay, but I'm faithfully witnessing to the very people who are giving it to me on the chin, which is how the martyrs have witnessed And so I encourage you to pray with me. Join as a congregation. Set your hearts to prayer because we are initiating these these series of of things that we want to do to increase our ability as a congregation to engage in evangelism and outreach. We're purposefully pursuing the Great Commission, taking gospel ministry outside the walls of this church. And gospel ministry always attracts what? Well, let's, let's prepare for it. Let's prepare now. Let's ask Jesus to make us devout men and women who are fit to stand no matter what might erupt, no matter what the cost will be. Will you pray that? If we ask the question, well, what happened after Stephen died? And you want to summarize it succinctly. Well, here's what happened after Stephen died. The world continued to act like the world, and the church continued to act like the church. Stephen died 2,000 years ago, and the infant church in Jerusalem now spans the globe. Why? Because despite the persecution, they continue to witness to Jesus. Gospel ministry has, for 2,000 years, attracted opposition, and for 2,000 years, Jesus has overcome, and for 2,000 years, he has built his church, and for 2,000 years, the gates of hell have not prevailed against it, and they shall never prevail against it. So join me in asking Jesus to light a fire of devotion in me so that I and you and we together might continue faithfully to witness to Jesus Christ no matter what might erupt. Please pray with me. Our gracious God and Father, we would be this type of believer, and we know that it's up to you. Father, in ourselves, we admit that we are weak and childish, we are fearful and timid, but we pray that you would give us a hope and a home that is beyond the reach of persecution. We pray that you would give us a love for the lost that is greater than a love for our comfort, a love for the lost that is willing to endure any amount of scorn or rebuke or even persecution if Jesus is but glorified and the lost come to know him. Father, we confess that he is the head of the church, that he is our great shield and defender, and that for 2,000 years he has built his church. We would be faithful in being his instruments to continue its building. Father, we pray that you would do this for the glory of Jesus, for the good of the church, and for the salvation of the lost, and we commit it all in Jesus' name. Amen.